Masechet Baba Batra Daf Kof Zayin. On the previous staff, we saw a case of two brothers who split an inheritance, and then all of a sudden, a third long lost brother comes and says, Wait, I'm a brother too. And we had a controversy between Rav and Shemuel. Rav says the original division is cancelled and they redivide everything, whereas Shemuel says we uphold the original division, but we have to take off a piece from the original two brothers and they each have to give some of their land to the third brother. But what they, the basic division uh, stands, right, uh, brother A gets this land, brother B gets that land, but then they take each uh, third of their land and give it to the brother who comes from far away. Now we're going to see another variation of this case. Itmar. Achin shechalku uba ba'al chovenatal chelko shel echad mehen. Rav amar batla machloket. Ushmuel amar viter. Verav ase amar no you have two brothers, they split an inheritance. Um, okay, so, so far so good. But then there is a debtor, a creditor, someone that the father owed money to. And now he comes to the sons to collect his debt. And he comes, let's say the brothers are Reuven and Shimon, he comes to Reuven and he takes all of Reuven's property, his entire share. Now what do we do? See, they already split it, so um, how do we reconcile this? Okay, so he took one of them, so there's three different opinions here. Rav says, the original division is null and void, rather they take the remaining land, uh, he took the portion of A, so they take the portion of brother B, or Shimon, and they take that and they redivide it in half and Reuven gets half of that and Shimon gets half of that. So in the end, the Reuven and Shimon will have an equal amount. It'll be half of what they had before, but they redivide it. So that's Rav who says the, um, we cancel what was there before. Rav is consistent with what he said in the last case when the brother comes from overseas. This is a similar situation where it's not a brother that comes, but rather a creditor. Okay, they redivide it. Shmuel, however, says that they uh, it's it's for, foregone. Once they divide it, that's it. It's a final division. It's a final sale. He's treating the division like now that they divided it, they're no longer brothers that are sharing an inheritance. That was before they divided it. Once they divide it, it's kind of like a sale and like a final sale without a guarantee. The government is going to go through each of these and explain them. And therefore, that's Reuven's bad luck. They split it. It's a final split. And the credit he could have chosen this one or that one. He had a right to collect from either one of them. He happened to choose that of the event. Maybe it was a, he, he liked it a little nicer. It was closer to where he lived. And he took it Ovens. That's it. When by in the act of dividing, he gave away the future rights to the other part of the land that Shimon got. So that's it. At the end of the day, only Shimon has property. Reuven has no property to bed for him. Rav Aser presents a compromise position, and he says that Reuven, once Reuven's land is all taken away, he can come to Shimon and he can recoup a part of what he lost, half of what he lost. And so he can take a quarter um, either in land or in money. Basically, Shimon can decide what, what he's going to give. If Shimon wants to give him land, he can give him land or he can give him money. But how much does he get? He's not going to get the, um, the full half that's left, but only a quarter of it, um, because this is a compromise position between Rav and Shemuel. Rav says that um, uh, Reuven will get half of what's left. Um, Shemuel says he will get zero of what's left. According to Rav Aseh, uh, well, we're not sure what should happen. So since it's a safek, mamon mutab a safek, cholkin, and so he gets a quarter, and Shimon uh, will have three quarters of the remaining land after the creditor took everything. Okay, the Gemara will explain each in turn. Rav Amar Batla Machloket Kasabar Achin Shechalku Yorshin Hen. Rav says that the original division that they made beforehand is cancelled and they redivide it because he thinks that even after they divide the inheritance, they're still called brothers who divided an inheritance. They're still inheritors and therefore they still have a responsibility to each other that if an, a creditor comes, a creditor that uh, um, uh, he uh, was owed money by the father. And so both of their lands are still uh, indebted to that creditor. So the creditor takes one of their lands. They're still considered brothers who have inherited and they're, therefore they're responsible for each other. So the division goes, goes all the way back and they divide whatever is left.
ושמואל אמר ויתר, כך סבר האחים שחלקו לקוחות הבו, וכלוקח שלא באחריות דמה. שמואל says that Although, once the, when the father died, now they're brothers who have an inheritance, a shared inheritance. Once they divide it, they're considered the same as buyers. Buyers who don't have a, a guarantee. When you buy something, you can get a guarantee on the land uh, that if it, if it should be taken away, then the seller has to repay you. Or sometimes it's without a guarantee, in which case it's a final sale. Don't come back. Even if it's taken away by some creditor that has a lien on it, sorry, it's your loss. Okay, so in this case, once they divide it, it's like a purchaser without a guarantee, and therefore it's Reuven's bad luck that the creditor chose Reuven's property, and that's it. He cannot, Reuven cannot go back, and we do not re-divide it. Rav is in doubt about which one, who's right, Rav or Shemuel. Are they considered still inheritors and therefore uh, Reuven should get half of what's left? Or is it like a buyer, in which case like Shemuel, he gets zero uh, of, of, from, of what's left and Shimon keeps his entire property? And therefore, we make a compromised position. Whenever there's money that's in doubt, we split it is one of the principles. And therefore, he gets a quarter. And it's up to the seller, Shimon, to decide. He, Shimon could say, listen, okay, fine, I'll give you a quarter of my property, and that, then, then you'll have a quarter. Or Shimon could say, listen, if he came and took my property, I would have paid him in cash. I have cash. And he doesn't have to give him land. He's a creditor. He could pay in cash if he wanted. Since I would have paid in cash, so I'll pay you cash. I don't want to give you my land. So he has a right to do that. He can choose the quarter of, this, uh, of land or a quarter of money. All right, now that we have these three opinions, what is the halacha? Amara papa hilcheta bechol haneshmatata mekamesin. Our papa says in all these types of laws, we say that they take off a share. So this would be the equivalent of what Shemuel said in the previous daf. On that case, when the third brother comes from overseas, so each one takes a portion of his and gives it. In this case, um, it wouldn't be precisely like any of these three opinions, but it's mostly like Rav Aser, um, except that it sounds like he would have to give land. Um, that the Shimon, the brother who what, nothing was taken away, has to give part of his land to Reuven uh, to make up for what he lost. Um, so that's Rav Papa says, that's the halacha in these types of cases. Amemad Amar Batla Machloket. Amar says, no, I follow Rav in these types of cases. Once uh, there's a, a you have to redivide it uh, because there's a new situation. There's a third brother that came or there's a creditor that came, so the original division was not fair. We consider the brothers still to be brothers who divided an inheritance, but they're still inheritors, so we redivide it. And the halacha is like amemad, that we uh, cancel the original division and they have to divide it all over again. And now we learn a new baraita tenor banan shelosha sheyaradu lashum echad omer bemane ushnaim omerim bematayim echad omer bematayim ushnaim omerim bemane batel yachid bemiuto. If you have three experts who go to assess a certain property, let's say for orphans, is minor orphans, and a creditor comes and he needs to be paid, or they have to pay for uh, the upkeep of their sister or something like that. So uh, because they're orphans, we want to make sure that their land is going to be sold at a fair price. So three experts have to go and assess how much the land is worth to make sure that it will get a good price. Now, what if the three experts disagree? What price do we land on? So here's a simple case. If one of them says it's worth 100 dinar and two of the experts say 200, or the other way around, if one of them says it's worth 200 and the other two say it's worth 100, then you're going to follow the majority. The minority opinion is canceled and we follow the opinion of two of the judges over the one. That's easy. But what if they all disagree? One of them says it's 100 dinar. The other says it's 20 sela. 20 sela is equal to 80 dinar. So whenever you see eight, uh, 20, just multiply by 4, that's 80. And the other one says 30, which again, we're going to multiply by 4 to get from sela to dinar, and that's 120. So you have three experts. One says 100, one says 80, and one says 120. Okay. 
What do you do? The first Tanakama here says, you go by 100, right in the middle. Happens to be the median, it's also the average of all them. Uh, so that's the first opinion. Rabbi Eliezer, be Rabbi Sadok, Omer Nidon Betishim. So Rabbi Eliezer, son of Rabbi Sadok, says 90. Gemara will explain how we get to 90. That's neither of the opinions, not 80, not 100, not 120. We'll explain that. And the third opinion, Va'acherim, Omerim, Osin Shuma Benehen Umeshaleshin. He says that we take a difference, the difference between the highest and lowest numbers, and we and we divide it by three and add it to the lowest number. In this case, it would be 120 is the highest number, minus 80 is the lowest number, is 40. So take 40, divide that by three, you get 13 and a third. Add that to the lowest number, which is 80, and you get 93 and a third. So that's the three opinions here. One says 100, one says 90, and one says 93 and a third. Let's analyze. Manda don bemane milita mesiata. The first opinion that says 100. So that's you following the middle uh, number, 100. The median, it seems to be the median, although it happens to be the average, is also the same. Rabbi Eliezer be Rabbi Sadok omen nidon betishim kasabad ha ad a tishim hav shava. Vahayde ka marisim de kata e asara la achore. Vahayde ka amar mane kata en asara le kame. So let's, uh, let's take 90 because what we're going to try to do is make it like a two against one. So we're going to take two that are close to each other. So let's say it's really 90. And the one that said that the land is 80, well, he was just a 10 behind. He was 10 too low, but pretty close. And the one who said 100, uh, he overshot. He went a little too high by 10. But if you take the 80 and the 100, they're both near 90. So therefore, let's take the combination of the 80 and the 100, since they're both only 10 away from 90, and say, well, they could agree on 90. And then that's the 2, and we reject the 120 altogether. Now, you're asking the question that the Gemara is going to ask next. Well, you can make the same argument between the 100 and 120, right? We can assume that the real value is 110. And the one who said 100, uh, he shot a little bit too low. He got 10 too low. And the one who said 120, he shot a 10 dinar too high. But really what the 100 and 120 have in common is they're both pretty near 110. So let's take those two um, together and make it 110 and we could ignore the 80 altogether. So you can make the same argument for 90 as you would make for 110. The answer is No, you know what? Take the lower value in your hand, the first two assessments, because that assessment of 90 does not pass a uh, 100. And therefore, the idea is that the one who says 120 will agree that it's worth at least 90. So the 90 is, is definitely included within the 120. The 120 just says it's even more. So therefore, when you have a, a choice between two numbers, two ways of compromising and reconciling, in this case, 90, we could take the 80 and 100 and make them both close to 90, or the 100 and 120 make them both close to 110, well, then we should take the lower number. It's enough that you have that number, and so we'll, we will shoot for the low one but rather than the high one because the highest number includes the lower number, so let's not pass the 100 mark. Okay, Acherim Omrim, Osim Shuma Benehen Ume Shaleshin. Now we're going to get to Acherim, um, who says that we take the difference between the higher and lower numbers, divide it by three, and add it to the lower number. Kasabde Hayar Atish in Utlata Vitilata Shavya. Um, his reasoning of Acherim is that we let's assume that the actual value of the land is 93 and a third. And then we can explain how why that should be a good compromise between all the other numbers. The one who said 80, he undershot by 13 and a third. The one that says 100, he also was off by 13 and a third. And really, in his mind, he wanted to say 13 and a third more, right? So instead of the 96, uh, 93 and a third, he was going to say 106 and two thirds. But once he heard the first guy say, 
80, which was, you know, off, off by 13 and a third down, he was going to say 13 and a third higher. He said, listen, well, he already went so low. Let me, add, I don't want to go, I don't want to push my luck. I'll just add uh, up to 100 so that I shouldn't be so different from my colleague. And so he only went to 100. But really, he wanted to say uh, 106 and two thirds. So therefore, we could take those two, the lower numbers, and assume that really they hover nearby the 90 and a third mark. So we could take those two as being in agreement, the compromise between them, and ignore the 120 altogether. And then we ask the same question. Wait, why don't we take the higher two numbers? And let's assume that in fact the real value is 113 and a third. The one who says 100, he lowballed. 13 and a third. The one who said 120, really his initial assessment was going to be 13 and a third higher than the, um, than the actual number, which would be 126 and two thirds. That's what he wanted to say. He was really going to say the higher number. But then he said, it's enough that I should add just somewhat above my I don't want to go so much. I'll just push the number up a little bit higher. That's why he said 120. But really, the guy who says 100 and the one who says 120 were off by the same amount uh, initially, by 13 and a third. And so we can combine those two together uh, as one and then ignore the 80 altogether. So that's the same logic. Why not do that? And the answer is the same as before. No, take the first two lower assessments in your hand, because if you have something in your hand, right, better, better one in your hand than two in the bush, better to take the lower number and not go past the 100 dinar mark, because within the higher number is included the, the, the lower number. The 120 guy will agree that it's at least worth the 93 and a third, and so better to take the lower number. Ravuna says the halacha should follow Acherim, who says the 93 and the third. Ravashe says we don't understand the reasoning for them, so the halacha should be like them. And there's this reasoning, although we just explained it, it takes a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, a creative mathematics to figure out what this is. So what? Just because you don't know the uh, understand it, that's why you're following the halacha. So Ravashe disagrees. He doesn't think the halacha should be like that. Tanu. Uh, the judges of the exile, they also said like Achirim, that we take the difference between the highest and the lowest and we divide into three and we add that to the lowest number. Rav Huna said, Halacha is like them, just like he said, Halacha is like Achirim. And Rav has the same response. Rav says, we don't understand the reasoning of, uh, of the judges of the exile, so why should we follow the Halacha according to their opinion? And so Rav says, we should not follow the Halacha according to Achirim. We now come to the last Mishnah in the Perek. Someone owns a field and he sell, tells his friend, I am going to sell you half of my field. So you don't divide it just by area in half, but rather you make an assessment of the value and the buyer takes half of the field. We're going to see the Gemara will say he takes the half that is worse. In other words, even though they're of equal value, um, but you have higher, uh, uh, higher yield land, right? Really good land, a smaller amount is worth the same as a larger area of lower quality land. Even though they're the same price, nevertheless, everybody would pr- would rather have a smaller amount of high quality, quality land. So they split it not by area, but rather they make an assessment to see what a, you know, you split it into two uh, that are of equal value, and the buyer will take the lower quality, even though he's actually he might get actually more of the area. If the seller says, I am selling you half of my field that is in the south, I'm going to get the north part, you get the south part. Well, then again, it's not by area, but we make an assessment of the value and we make a dividing line that the northern part over over here is equal in value to this whole area below that line in the south. And in that case, the buyer gets whatever is in the south, whatever quality it is. 
מקום הגדר חריס ובן חריס, וכמה הוא חריס שישה טווחים ובן חריס שלושה. And the buyer has to take upon himself to leave space for the wall and also the large ditch and the small ditch. This would be his field is here inside. This is where he plants stuff. So this is the um, this is the border that's towards the outside where other people you know to, for for the next to the street or next to the next field. And you have to make a um, a wall uh, to protect from animals coming in. A wall is not sufficient because many animals can jump over the wall. So rather than making a higher wall, uh, it was customary to build a ditch. The Gemara will explain why you need two ditches, uh, but the uh, that does give a um, a value of how big they are. And so how big is the large ditch? A ditch is uh, six tefachim. That probably means both breadth and depth is six tefachim. And the small one is only three tefachim, uh, both wide and deep. So the uh, the buyer has to uh, leave some area uh, from his land, uh, his half that he gets, uh, in order to make that wall and those two ditches. Gemara explains. Amar Rabbi Chia bar Abba Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Lokech notel kachush shebo. Rabbi Chia, the son of Abba, says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, in the first case where he doesn't specify north or south, he just says, I'm selling you half of the land. We make an assessment of two halves that are of equal value, although not necessarily equal in size, and the buyer gets the lower quality land. Even though, let's say, the whole land is worth a million dollars, and you split it into two, half a million and half a million, but one half, that's what part that the seller keeps, is a smaller amount of very high quality land, and then the buyer takes the larger amount of lower quality land, even though they're both, both worth the same, um, a same value in terms of the market price. So now we have a question from Rabbi Chia Bar Abba asks Rabbi Yochanan, hold on, the Mishnah says that they make an assessment. So doesn't that mean that they make an assessment and they're of equal value? So why are you saying that the buyer gets the worst type of land? Where, where do you see that? Where do you get that from? And so Rabbi Yochanan has a sharp comeback. He says, you, Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, while you were eating dates in Bavel, apparently he went on some trip to Bavel for a while and was studying there, but you were enjoying yourself with the luxuries of Bavel, sitting there eating dates. You did not apply yourself like we did over here in Eretz Israel to the study of, of, the Mishnah, of this Mishnah. And we explained the Resha based on the continuation in the Sefa of that Mishnah. This Mishnah, this Mishnah, the Katani Sefa. Chetzia Badarom Ani Mochelecha, Meshamenin Benehen, Venotel Chetzia Badarom, Vamai Meshamenin Benehen, Vachesia Badarom Amale, Ela Lidme, Hachaname Lidme. The case in the Sefa is that the seller says, I'm going to sell you the half, half of this field, the half that's in the south. So the Mishnah says that we bring assessors and the buyer takes the half that's in the south. Now, why do we need assessors? He already said, you're taking the southern half. So if it doesn't matter what the value of the land is, the quality of the land, high quality, low quality, just take half of the land by area, then uh, why would you need assessors? Because you don't need assessors. He already says, just take the southern in half. Rather, you see that we have to um, separate it by its value, um, not by the area. And so, too, just like in the Sefa, we look at the value, and so I know you what you get the half, but it doesn't mean you get the, I know you get the southern half, but it doesn't mean half in area, it means half in value. Whatever is in the south, you get half, but we have to assess where the demarcation line would be, that the, oh, everything above and to the north of that line would be equal in value to everything b- below that line. So too in the Resha, it's the same thing, where he did not say the uh, the south. Uh, we can't just say, you know, cut it up in half. We don't need the assessors just to say, oh, here is half of the land of area. No, rather, we need the assessors to say, this is higher quality, is equal in value to this much that's lower quality, and the buyer takes the lower quality land. So Rabbi Yochanan says, see, we can use the Sefa to explain the Resha. The Resha. 
גדל וכולי טענה, חריס מבחוץ ובין חריס מבפנים, וזה, וזה אחורי גדר. So, the buyer accepts upon himself to leave space for the fence and the big ditch and the small ditch. Abraita explains where you place these ditches, that the large ditch is going to be on the outside and the small ditch on the inside, and both of them are behind the fence. Uh, just like in this picture, where you have the land is in here, this is towards the outside, where animals are... Uh, people might come in, and so you have the large ditch is first, then the small ditch, and then the um, wall is after them. And we're going to explain the need for all three. Um, you have to put the ditch on the outside so that an animal will not be able to jump over the fence. If it's flat on the outside, uh, then an animal can jump over the fence. So rather than make the fence even higher, we just make a ditch, and that way it'll be harder for it to uh, jump if it's all the way down in the ditch. So why not make just a big ditch and not a small one? And the answer is, Now because the big ditch is wide, so many animals will be able to stand inside a six tefach wide ditch and they'll be able to jump even from there. So that's why we need a small ditch right next to it so that um, that will protect uh, the, so that the large ditch will be even farther away and uh, will be too far to, to jump from the depth of the large ditch and in, over the wall, and they can't get closer because there's a small ditch there. So why not make just the small ditch and not the big one? Because the small ditch will already, already keep them far um, uh, far enough away. And the answer is, No, because it's small, so the animal could uh, stand at the edge and jump and still make it over it. So if you had, didn't have the um, if you didn't have the small if this small one let's say was a big one um, then the animal could just stand inside that big ditch and still jump over so you need the small one so that the far the large one could be farther away and it can't stand in this area so now why not just make the small one and and no, don't put the big one instead because the small one's going to make sure that it won't be it won't be close. No, you can't do that because then it could stand. If let's say the big dish wasn't wasn't there, it would be able to stand at the edge of the small one over here and still be able to jump over. Now this edge we're going about to see is a very small, so an animal cannot stand on the edge between the two ditches. It can't stand inside the small ditch. It can stand in the larger dish, but that's uh, that's already too far away. So by having this triple protection, each one ensures that uh, the animal will not be able to jump over. Uh, so that's, and then the last line is, ben haris le ben haris. How much space is there between the large ditch and the smaller one? Tefach, it's only one hand breadth. Since only one hand breadth between them, an animal cannot stand on that. Hadran alach bet kor.